Hello and welcome to From the Ground Up, a podcast from the University of Chicago's public policy podcasts. My name is Quinn and I'm here with my friends Logan. Hey there. Rand. Hey everyone. And Christian. Howdy. Today, we are joined by Baba Freeman, an ESG researcher at the Payne Institute for Public Policy at the Colorado School of Mines. Baba, let's get right into it. The energy transition is coming. We'll get into some more specific questions about mineral extraction, green technology, and fossil fuels, but just to set the stage, what are the stakes of the energy transition for developing countries in Africa and around the world? What is on the line for these countries as they navigate this change? Hi, Quinn. Hi, guys. Uh, Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure to join this conversation this morning. Right. Um, So uh, there was a lot going on and uh, regarding the transition to uh, decarbonized energy. And like you rightly mentioned, you know, uh, all over the world, there are different kind of countries uh, with different types of readiness, you know, for for the energy transition. Uh, From the perspective of developing countries, for instance, it's not quite the same as in the pressure to decarbonize is not quite the same as it is in industrialized countries. Take, for instance, many, many developing countries do not even have sufficient energy, you know, for their citizens as we speak. So the question of uh, transition into another form of energy is, is, is never, ever top of mind for them. Uh, in addition, in a place like the U.S. and Western Europe, the decarbonization is taken the form of electrification, Right. And so uh, we, the, the, over the next uh, few decades, there might be some form of uh, movement of transportation infrastructure, you know, cars, trucks and all that, you know, from, from gasoline, from internal combustion engines to uh, electronic EVs, basically. Now, if you're in a place like Uganda, right, where there's not even enough electricity, then, you know, the idea of, you know, moving from gasoline to electricity, you know, could be... Uh, you might come across as a joke to folks who don't even have a sufficient energy at the present time to power their cars, you know, to to get from point A to point B. So that's one way to look at it. The other thing that's also going on regarding the transition is this. If you are an oil producing country or you're a country that's rich in coal and your energy predominantly has come from these sources, as well as your revenue, export revenue has come from these sources, that anything that calls for a transition might scare you. Because what we might have is a currency of stranded assets, which means that a coal field that you've hoped would provide power on commercial terms for the next 50 years might suddenly become uncommercial, right, for one reason or the other. Now, one reason why it might become uncommercial is that uh, the funders of infrastructure, you know, the international finance agencies, for instance, uh, may discriminate against spending money on supporting carbonized energy. And so you might not be able to finance that coal field or oil field, you know, as, as time goes on. Now, what does that do? It immediately robs the country of export revenue and it robs its people of an opportunity to make an income. OK, and that truncates the desires of these nations to move out of low income status, uh, you know, to middle or high income status. So in a nutshell, those are two ways of looking at it. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you for setting the stage for us. Thanks, Baba. So my question is, since we're seeing an accelerating shift towards green technologies and the demand for rare earth minerals, which many African countries are rich in, Mm -hmm. how can countries benefit from the commodity boom in the battery minerals demand? For countries that are rich in such uh, transition minerals that go into EVs and battery technology and uh, even transmission line uh, technology. There really is uh, one predominant way and one secondary way of tapping into that, or rather one, one reason to. The first is that, you know, if you are able to, if you're like a country like Zambia, rich in copper, if you're like Congo, you're, you're rich in uh, cobalt and, and other minerals, then anything that increases the demand for those minerals might help increase your revenue as a nation. Okay, so that's one way to do it. If the map plays out in that way, then it might encourage uh, further investment into such countries in the mining sector. Okay, so that's one way. Uh, the other benefit that might come to these nations is that anytime investment comes into a nation, then there are secondary effects, uh, which is that, you know, there's more work for folks to do. There's more tax revenue for the government. And more importantly, which is often underlooked, there's an opportunity for a transfer of not just technology, but a transfer of know-how, management know-how into these communities and those countries. So two opportunities, you know, which are related and yet separate uh, for countries that are rich in mineral resources for the energy transition. Thank you. So what are the responsibilities of global financial systems investing in minerals from Africa? Very good question. 
But truth be told, investors and financial agencies, they have zero responsibility towards towards anyone, right? Because the, the, the reason why people lend out money is to make a rate of return, right? So, the, so really, in some sense, there's no obligation, no responsibility for such organizations. However, if you're on the other side of the pond and you're one of uh, these uh, developing countries that are rich in certain minerals, what you hope is to get some sense of fairness from a finance agency that's seeking to that's looking for an opportunity to back finance in any anywhere in the world. What I mean to say is that you know, for many uh, developing countries, for instance, whenever they do borrow money or whenever anybody borrows money to build a project anywhere in the developing world, they find that the, the interest rates are substantially higher than for comparable projects elsewhere in the world. The reason is that the perception of risk of doing business in the third world country is so high. And in some cases, in some cases, perception of risk is not related to the reality on ground because for a financier in New York and Geneva, if you mention Africa, they begin to panic. But South Africa is not the same thing as, as Malawi and Nigeria is not the same as Burkina Faso. So they do not necessarily belong in the same risk bucket. So from the perspective of a developing country, you will expect that kind of fairness. Secondly, if you are an international finance organization, i.e. you're not strictly into it for commercial purposes, and I mean the World Bank, the IMF, you will expect that analysis of projects in developing countries should at least take into consideration the overall interests of the region. What we're seeing is that for some organizations and some institutions, where folks are looking at uh, investment in minerals and energy only in terms of the energy transition which affects the world, right? Now, African countries, for instance, you know, themselves do generate less than 5% of global emissions. So you can imagine that they're outraged at the idea that they're finding it hard to raise financing to improve themselves because of somebody else's emissions, right? While financial institutions have no obligation per se, there's expectation of fairness and of, uh, what can I say, of, of well-rounded knowledge also about the needs of the Africans and the needs of the other de developing regions as these decisions are made. So I just have a follow-up. So if I am on the other side of the pond, as you said, and I am either a government in one of those countries that you mentioned or uh, someone who is looking to capitalize on this transition, what is my strategic path to doing that? Okay, uh, if I understand you correctly, you're wondering what other pathways exist for uh, stakeholders in developing countries to develop their assets. Am I correct? Yeah, and you know, what do you think that they should do? Okay, as a matter of fact, I don't think it requires much thinking. It's that one must do what one can do, right? So the so the 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 question has been answered by the circumstances, and the circumstances such that uh, you you're the government of Burkina Faso or you're the government of Bangladesh, and no one will lend you money on terms that are reasonable, then what do you do? And what you must do is to be to find a, another way of developing that does not rely on that much external financing. So philosophically, that's it. Thankfully, uh, the world is not a unipolar world anymore. There are other institutions in other parts of the world that may be more amenable to taking risks. So those people must be courted. They must be courted in the most rigorous way. And they may not always be the most palatable, you know, folks that uh, they may not be the kinds of people we read about in Fortune magazine or in Forbes, right? So to answer the question very basically, developing countries must find people and find sources of financing internally and externally to fund the projects that need to be developed, even if it means that they are the kinds of projects that will not meet the the huddle rates or the requirements of Western finance agencies in terms of environmental stewardship and also in terms of business practices. Yeah, thank you. All right. So the same shifts that we've uh, been talking about will drive down demand uh, for fossil fuels, uh, especially in more developed uh, countries that are further along in the decarbonization process through electrification like we uh, discussed earlier. And we touched on some of these aspects previously, but right now and over the past several decades, many of the largest uh, African economies have been undergirded by fossil fuels, either in operation of the economies or as an export market. Uh, in your view, uh, how should countries like uh, Nigeria, uh, Libya, and Angola, which are all members of OPEC, uh, navigate this transition? And is this what we're seeing happening right now? In terms of what is happening, I believe uh, many developing nations are kind of in a state of shock because of the pace of the change in demand for their products. 
which is playing out to them in terms of lower prices, up until recently, in terms of lower prices. And also in terms of the unwillingness of the sudden retreat from uh, in a place like West Africa, which is rich in oil and gas, a sudden retreat, you know, from the you no know, people who normally invest in those regions, i.e. ExxonMobil, Shell, Chevron, you know, those uh, companies and institutions have been retreated and they've been taken out of their investment from those countries in a way that uh, was unforeseen. And of course, they are doing what they need to do because uh, they need to reshuffle their portfolio. In North America, for instance, there's opportunity arose, you know, to produce shale from North, from North America. And uh, oil sands, you know, you know, from further north as well. So many people have repurposed their their portfolios to retrench from African investments and to invest more in North America. I mean, for, for obvious reasons, geologically, uh, your shale oil comes to market faster. You don't have to wait for 15, 20 years to develop the oil field offshore anyway. So you, you do the drilling faster, you produce faster. So your revenue starts flowing faster. Secondly, you are in you are in, you are in North America. You're in an OECD country. You know the laws and the people. The political risk is less, right? So for, for those reasons, uh, certain changes have taken place. Now, for the countries in, in West Africa, for instance, the first thing they had to do was to look at their laws and to say, how can we make the laws a bit more attractive? How do we attract more capital? Right, so, so, so that these guys do not leave in droves and maybe some even come. And I think that's where they are right now, trying to take another look at the laws and trying to make it more attractive. The way things work in many developing countries is that things do not work very fast. It takes about 20 years to change a law, for instance. And uh, in that time, uh, you, you know, you can expect that the oil and gas market, for instance, would have gone through like two troughs and two peaks, right? Which even further complicates uh, anyone's appetite to invest in a commodity business because, you know, the, the, the pricing is not certain. No one really knows what the pricing is going to be like, right? So that's essentially what I see many of the uh, oil and gas producing nations doing right now, you know, trying to redo their their laws and uh, as well as uh, trying to find different ways of making it more attractive to invest in those regions. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So they're trying to make themselves more attractive to investors through reductions of tariffs and uh, other controls and, and things like that, or are there other instruments that they're using? Yes, essentially through, uh, uh, you know, by trying to rejig the tariffs and trying to even introduce more accountability into their own management of those resources by trying to reorganize, you know, their, uh, the, you know, government-owned uh, oil and gas producing companies, right? And try to and do all those two things. Because even as they're trying to attract more overseas investment, they're also trying to demonstrate more accountability in such a way that you know the the, the nations can get a bigger bang for the buck they're getting. Uh, and to, in some cases, try to ring fence the, the domestic and national oil producers, you know, from political uh, interference, you know, corruption and slow management decision making and stuff like that. So there's, there's been a whole lot going on uh, in that regard. In terms of whether it has achieved anything, no, it hasn't achieved anything at all. Uh, the other thing which uh, is also going on simultaneously is that there is a, there's been an appetite for not, uh, liquefied natural gas, right, uh, over the years. And so uh, countries such as Nigeria, they're trying to expand, you know, their capacity to to sell liquefied natural gas into the market, because that's also, and maybe we'll talk about that later, that's also something else they're doing to improve their revenue situation. That's right. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that. And you've really outlined a really good analysis of the situation and the obstacles that these countries are facing. I do want to get a little more into the specifics here. In both of these domains with like mining for minerals, extracting fossil fuels, getting oil, stuff like that, could you tell us about some countries or projects that have actually had some success, have been like particularly sustainable and stable and things like that? And maybe like what lessons could we learn from those examples? I believe the the, the story to be told is a macro story because it, it doesn't really Unless you're interested in company-specific information, I'm not sure it, it, it substantially changes the narrative. Where if I had one company somewhere in, in Botswana doing something right and everybody else is a deal back in the, in, in the 1970s, right? But just to buttress the point a little bit, maybe just to add some value, anywhere you've seen the LNG companies going up, the LNG companies have, well, typically they will be run as a joint venture between the government of the nation and whomever as you know, the private sector has had the resource 
of the resource base or the, the financial resources to invest in this. So what the LNG companies do, for instance, what, what it has done for a country like Angola, a country like Nigeria, and perhaps even uh, Equatorial Guinea, is that it, it kind of like a sh- it partially shields this portion of this nation's revenue from the fluctuation and the price of crude. And if your nation, in fact, any country out there, even if it's Bolivia, you want some kind of uh, stability in your revenue. You know, because you because you need that money. You can't afford to just have a ninety percent drop in, in in tax revenue and royalty revenue one year. That could lead to a, a lot of uh, other issues. So LNG has done that for many African countries that have the resources, including Algeria, uh, which has so many trains of LNG and they're so close to the end market. Now the other thing, uh, other than the price stability, which uh, LNG has done, is this: in some of those nations, there was no internal market for gas. So what happened was that the gas used to be flared off. It used to basically be burned off. And imagine that as just somebody picking up a few thousand dollar bills and just, you know, burning them off. You know, so with LNG, you, you're able to not burn off as much gas as you used to and instead convert that waste into a revenue source that that it gets paid for in dollars. So that's that's very, very insightful. It's it's a very positive thing for the nations that have LNG, you know, to stop burning a resource that has commercial value and instead to realize the commercial um, value from that resource that used to be wasted. The third aspect of that is that it perhaps also has improved the emission situation because if you're no longer burning up dirty gas at, at the well site and you're converting it as, into something, then probably you know the flaring of methane, uh, CO2, uh, methane sources is probably less than it otherwise would have been. Gotcha. So it sounds like to me what you're saying is it's less about specific projects and specific reactions to situations working out and more about being able to reshape the environment itself. I use environment here not in the green sense, but more in like the our situation in order to be sustainable. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I agree. I agree with that assessment because the, the, there is the business environment, the environment for... Uh for investment, you know, the political risk environment, stuff like that. So for me, that's where the story is, because uh, especially for a policy person, if uh, I was talking to a, a business person who had an idea somewhere he wanted to situate a mine in the Niger Republic, it's a different conversation because it's both macro and micro, in which case uh, one has to get into the specifics of where is the mine going to be located? What are the routes to market? Is there a war in the country? Uh, what about the folks buying it? Are they Are they credible? Are the credible uh, counterparties and what have we? Thanks, Baba. So, taking what you just said about um, where the mines are located, where these resources are located, uh, mm-hmm. you wrote in your article a new paradigm for managing mineral trade routes in Africa that roads in Africa tend to be underdeveloped and can be unreliable. And that could pose um, an obstacle to transporting goods. Ultimately, you suggested that it might prevent efficient trade within the continent of Africa. On that same issue, I wrote a related piece proposing that firms along the value chain be located near each other so that the mines, the processing firms, specifically smelters, mills, refineries, and manufacturing facilities would all be located near each other. Do you think that that type of co-location could help address the infrastructure bottlenecks you described and if not, what strategies do you think would be more effective? Okay, so we have to break that up into two. Maybe we'll come back to the second part uh, afterwards. The first part is that, you know, co-location is uh, an economic decision. It's also a decision that's related to politics. It is also a decision that's related to science. I cannot decide to mine gold where there is no gold. And I cannot process that gold in a place where there is no power as an electric power to run my furnace so in a place where there's no energy to run my furnace, okay? And even if I did that, at the end of the day, I still have to get it to market somehow, right? So however we look at it, you know, it, the, the issue of co-location is one that has to be dealt with specifically on a project-by-project project basis because of all those things that are, that are affecting it. Now, uh, the PRC, the People's Republic of China, dominates the processing of critical minerals not the mining of it, but the processing of it. So if you were to like dig up some rare earth mineral right in Kenya, chances are to process it, you have to get it out to somewhere in Guangdong, right? Uh, and as a result of that, it simply means that the cost of processing on a per unit basis is cheaper in China, right? Despite the distance between Kenya 
and China. Now, how did that happen? It was a political decision that was taken many years ago, decades ago, that the PRC will become dominant in the processing of certain minerals. You see, how we, so it relates to politics and also the sense of what is the political economy saying? Now, in some countries, want to retain a lot more of the processing domestically. And such countries, they implement policies such as, well, export taxes, i.e., if you dig up uranium from my country, I'm not going to ex let you export it in its raw form. I'm going to impose on you a tax. You pay me $10 per unit you, know, you want to export. The idea of those types of policies is to force you as a business person to consider putting as much processing as possible in close to you in the country where you mind so that they can retain as much as possible of the economic rent, you know, the employment, the additional taxes that come from uh, those further processing stages. So that's the way it would work. We'll have to work on a case by case basis. I mean, there's a reason why the largest market for automobiles in the world is in California, but most of the manufacturing is of parts and everything else is in China. You can see how, you know, you have to take it across the whole, the largest ocean in the world. Right, because that's what makes economic sense. Now, the Californians may have preferred if you could dig the iron in California, manufacture it in SoCal, sell it in, in Northern California, and they can control the entire supply chain. But economics and politics de determines ultimately how those things do shake out. Now, I'm just trying to say that there's a lot of consideration into that decision, and they have to do with nature, geology, with politics. You know, either policies that come, and also with simple economics, things go, things are arranged the way they are, often, most often, because that is the cheapest way to get stuff done. And that's what dictates what happens next. In terms of what one can do as a developing country to resolve that issue. Now, what is the problem with infrastructure? Infrastructure calls for a lot of upfront capital expenses. Now, if you're a developing nature, uh, country, by even the definition of that, you are lacking the financial resources to do that. And that's why the roads are bad and the bridges are bad and customs clearing takes forever, right? So once again, the, the answer comes from the context. What can you do? And what you can do if you're in that situation is to find the money however you can to build that infrastructure, all right? And to find the means however you can to manage that infrastructure in a way that is, it may not be the lowest cost, but at least it's efficient, right? Folks don't have to spend a month, you know, traveling 2,000 miles. Right. And then how you now do that, what shape and form that takes, you know, is now, it now becomes an engineering problem. But really, you have to solve the philosophical constraints and say, what, what do I need to do here? So it goes back to what I think we mentioned earlier on. You need to find that money anyhow you can. And you need to manage that resource as best as you can. Right. Yeah. So my next question is about one way that developing countries are increasingly funding that money through China's Belt and Road Initiative. And just mm -hmm. to fill in our listeners who might not be as familiar uh, with it, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is a multi-trillion dollar global infrastructure project that officially aims to connect China to the world and vice versa. But especially uh, in the Western world, uh, some commentators have seen some more nefarious aims behind it. Many BRI projects relate to energy or mineral extraction. Could you paint a picture uh, for our listeners about what these kinds of projects look like? Thank you. The, the ones I know about have to do with, uh, of course, it's all in the name as well. It has to do with developing the infrastructure for trade. And this takes the forms of railroads, roads, ports, and everything in between. In some cases, it might even go up to power generation, but I'm not sure about that. Yeah, Those are the kind of investments that I've seen coming out of the, uh, of the Build and Road Initiative. Now that we have ourselves like kind of situated in what uh, those kinds of projects look like in uh, many developing nations... I guess my my second part would be, uh, in your, your view, do these BRI projects represent a truly mutually beneficial opportunity for developing nations to complete these essential infrastructure improvements that we've talked about? Or more, might it be more of a geopolitical power play to yoke poor nations into debt traps, as mm -hmm. some analysts have conjectured, saying that it's a form of neo-colonialism or neo-imperialism and not purely uh, altruistic or beneficial in nature? Um for me, there's two ways you can look at it. One is if you have the luxury of being philosophical about it, that's clearly one option. But if you're a guy stuck in a place in Kumasi in Ghana, you can't get to the next town because, you know, some bridge, you know, broke down 20 years ago and no one fixed it. Then you surely will have another way of looking at it, which is that, you know, I didn't have something and now I have it. And therefore I can do things I couldn't do probably at a lower cost to me. 
Right. Now, no one is under any illusion that uh, it's a form of charity. I don't think it's been sold as, as charity, and I don't think anybody perceives it as that. And I don't even think the Africans or anyone else, you know, in Nicaragua, I don't think anybody wants charity. People have pride. They want to take pride in doing stuff. So I take that view. I take the practical view of, you know, was there a pot there? There wasn't. Is there a pot there now? Yes. Do we have access to the port? Yes. Can we use it? Yes. Can we trade better than we could before? Yep. Uh, and uh, if I if I also the lender who made the funds available to build the port or the road, I have no interest in in bankrupting the guy who owes me money. You know what I'm saying? Because then it's a risk to my to my investment. So those are some other ways of looking at it that totally sidestep the uh, issue of motives and uh, you know other points of view. Uh, just to go a little bit more in depth. One argument that I've heard from commentators in the U.S. is that while on principle, no no lender wants to see the recipient entities go bankrupt, some of the state-linked uh, funding sources might be willingly making more risky loans so that they can then take possession of the infrastructure. Like the government might own the port instead of the host government. In that case, they're not any better off than they were before. Do you think this trend or prediction is a little bit overblown or does it accurately reflect at least like some processes that are happening? I think it's less relevant in the big picture because there's there's, there's also two ways to look at it. If you're trying to if you're trying to commute between Naperville and downtown Chicago, right? And then some guy lent you money on and then he came to repossess the car. And then he told you, well, you still, you're still going to have access to the car, right? You can still, you don't have to walk from Naperville down to Chicago, right? You can you still have access to the car. It's just going to cost you a bit more. Then you're going to look at it and you're going to like complain bitterly and say, oh, well, this guy is a crook, is a loan shark and all that stuff. But when you compare yourself to the fact that before you have to walk the distance in snow and six feet of snow or three feet of snow, then you still have some benefit that's accruing to you. So what I'm trying to do there is to separate two things. One is the ownership. Two is the value. Uh, you know, so that, that's one way to look at it, and I think for me that's one way that has not been fully explored yet. You know, because very uh, people are very, very inspired, you know, by issues of ownership, right? And to flip it on its head, take for instance, let me give you a story. Uh, I grew up in Nigeria; that's where I was born. And at, at some point in, in Nigeria, the there was only one telecoms utility, and it belonged to the government. It was a government-owned utility, because so at that time the nation was had about 120 million people. And there were 240,000 telephone lines, right? And then, you know, some government came and said, oh, well, why don't we just liberalize it? Why don't we just say anyone who's got the money, come to Nigeria, you know, build, we're going to give about four licenses, build GSM mobile networks, right? So the first guys who came put on a lot of money, right? And then 18 months later, there were, there were 5 million lines, right? Okay. Now, the people did not own the means of delivering 5 million lines. What they owned delivered only a quarter of a million lines, right? So you see that there's a difference between ownership and what's best for the nation and the customers of the nation, the growth of the nation, and who actually owns what. Yeah, so that's one anal an analogy I think is more important than ownership, is that what are the people of the country getting? And the analogy I just gave, the people, they got employment, they got business opportunity, they got access to telephone lines, and it, none of it had anything to do with ownership. It had to do with the fact that some business person came and uh, invested for a rate of return. So that makes sense. So in the article that Christian mentioned uh, a minute ago, you describe the state of a lot of roads within the continent as dismal. And you say that the condition of those roads might pose like a significant barrier to trade. I know you also mentioned 2,000 miles in 30 days to move minerals from... Yeah, from the what? Copper Belt to, uh, to South Africa. Yeah, to perfect. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I'm curious... As you imagine a future, maybe five years, 10 years down the line, once a lot of these belt and road projects are completed, assuming that they're completed, what does that look like for the mining industry? Okay. The thing about the belt and road is that, you know, they're actually specific projects. It's not a carte blanche, you know, all comers. So some, some projects may have bearing on the oil and gas and then the mining industry. Some some wouldn't, and I, so I cannot really make a blanket statement. And I have to credit uh, Bloomberg with that. They broke the story about how between the copper mines in southern Congo and the uh, port of Durban in South Africa, at that time, uh, last year, or maybe early this year, it was, taking about, it was taking about a month or so 
to traverse that line. So it was reading that article that gave me the idea of saying, okay, well, what can be done? Yeah. So if there are uh, further infrastructure developments, then it, we should expect that it should help trade and investment, right? Because if I'm able to get stuff to market faster, I can get my revenue faster. My business thrives because my revenue cycle is shorter. My cash cycle is shorter and cash is a lifeblood of business. Secondly, if I'm able to get stuff to market then faster, then most likely my unit cost is also lower. And therefore, I am more competitive. I can offer my products from Congo to a smelter right in, in Thailand at, at a lower price because my unit cost is lower. And now because of all these things are happening to increase my speed to market, reduce my unit cost, right? Then it, it's most likely to result in other people taking more interest and in wanting to come to the Congo to invest, right? Because suddenly the, the case for investment is now more attractive, right? So once that happens, more money comes in and uh, more minds are built, more people find work, uh, the government has more revenue, the, the, the high schoolers leave in school, they have more work to do, Right, it should be an upward, an upward moving spiral. And and also one thing people always also not talk about enough is a transfer of skills, by which I mean management skills, right? Management skills because people learn skills by doing. So if I have a mine uh, somewhere and I employ three accountants, right? Then in three years, suddenly they're not just accountants; they're mining accountants, right? If I've employed like one guy to do my planning, budgeting, and forecasting, he's developing a skill set. He's learning how to manage a business, which uh, is also a benefit of its own. Because one day that guy might choose to start his own business as a supplier, and he brings the same level of competence, you know, to join this global supply chain and be able to offer services and get some revenue. Like, why does ESG investing matter in the context of resources and energy within the countries that you tend to focus on? That's a pretty interesting question. It all depends on how we answer. From the perspective of a country that is seeking investment, uh, the old idea that there's something called ESG investing is actually bewildering because that's got nothing to do with what's what's happening on ground, right? And the, just that we're even calling it a name is what is bewildering. Why? Because everybody who's living in a, a place close to a mine or an oil field, we already are aware that mining activity, you know, has the capacity to degrade your environment, right? And chances are you've already been agitating for the last 50 years that, you know what, a mine in my neighborhood, an oil, an oil well in my county should be run in such a way that it does not destroy the environment, it doesn't destroy my food sources, it doesn't destroy my farms, right? And that's nothing new to them, right? So they will be quite they will be bewildered and say, what's so intelligent about calling something a name, something we've been saying for so long? And by the way, you know, all we're asking for is that investment should by all means continue, but it should continue in a way that is responsible, in a way that, that adds value without destroying much. Then it should happen, you know, with consideration of the people who are in the community, in the county, in the country as a whole. So that's the way I would I would look at it. As it is right now, um, there's a risk of putting the cart before the horse. There will be no ESG investment without investment. ESG investing is about investing, not about ESG. It's just that we're trying to invest in a way that's responsible along those three axes. Yeah, that was really insightful. Thank you for that. To describe this situation further uh, with the ESG space, do we actually see that there are like some pretty important perspectives among shareholders? Do these matter? Do these tend to take different positions towards the community regarding health and environmental effects and the way that we extract oil and natural resources? Thank you for that question. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, yes, it does, and it, and it has. For the large companies, you know, that that are listed on the U.S., uh, you know, NYSC, the listed on the London, you know, stock exchange. For the large public companies, they have a history of reporting on on corporate social responsibility and on environmental stewardship, and uh, none of that is really new to them. It's been going on for decades upon decades, and of course, I mean, it 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 makes sense for them to focus on those things. Uh, because if there is a community disturbance in a place where you mine or drill, it, it will impact your business. Now, not even assuming that you're some subhuman guy, you don't care about people. It will impact your business. But most people tend to actually be human and they they don't hate people. They would rather be loved as in cooperate than uh, go in and break things just because they don't live there. So that's what I have seen. Now, it's never perfect. And one reason why it's never perfect is that sometimes the... The host nations do not have the capacity, the institutional capacity, to enforce laws that have been written. In some cases, there are also those within the community and within the uh, regulatory setup who are 
well, sometimes they lack competence and other times they pretend to lack competence because they're receiving bribes, right? And sometimes they do sabotage what should be done. So the responsibility for ESG-related matters in a developing country, the responsibility for that actually comes from the people who live in that country and their government. That's the way accountability should work. And that's the other way to look at it that needs to be considered. Thank you for that. You keep hitting on the point that lots of corporations that are now in the ESG space are really the same as they've always been. They just have a new name attached to it. Do you think then that there are actually any like important differences with the branding of ESG and how corporations operate within that space nowadays? I believe the, the corporations are, are quite responsible, right? And technology just change. And one of the things I know they suffer from is what is the consistent basis of reporting on your ESG? What are the metrics? Are these metrics uniform? Uh, how do you police these metrics to make sure that they're being done in the right way for the right purposes and by the right people in a way that's uh, comparable across time and across different operators? It would be nice for to have some clarity coming from there for external parties, such as interest, interest groups and others, to be able to analyze those things for themselves in a way that, that's meaningful. But other than that, I, I believe the large corporations are interested in all the right things whether it be the E, the S, and the G. And of course, uh, because they're public companies, they're called upon, they must report on those things. Their shareholders are called in upon them because corporations do not exist in a vacuum. And some of them, some boards, you know, you have environmentalists and some boards right now who are concerned about many things. I know I was, you know, working quietly behind the scenes and say, you know, we're going to do a better job here. We need more visibility into this and that. And uh, we, we promise we'll never ever pay bribes. In addition to that, there's a U.S. law called the FCPA, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, uh, which has actually discouraged a lot of people from doing, from performing, the, going about their business in a way that, uh, in a way that's not transparent, and uh, to discourage them from offering bribes and uh, spreading corruption. So I have confidence in those, in the corporations as well as the laws. The one thing that we often do not talk about because we do not have the visibility into it is that in many parts of the world, a lot of mining activities are actually carried out on a small scale. Then to govern the small scale space is very difficult. It's difficult to know what you know one guy and his two sons are doing uh, in the bush somewhere, right? Of of course they have a very small footprint, you know. But you know if you have a thousand small miners in a in a small place, each of the small foot footprints could add up to something. And some of some of the uh, mining practices may be bad for the health, such as you know the use of mercury in uh, gold mining in many parts of the world. Uh, these have health uh, consequences that are not pleasant at all. That's the other frontier for ESG practices. Gotcha. Thank you for that. Thank you. So on this show, we always wrap up with takeaways. A lot of listeners are students like us who are hoping to affect policies that are related to energy and the environment. So we were hoping that for your takeaway, you might be able to offer us some words of wisdom for those of us who are preparing to enter a policy space like this one that's particularly complicated. How do we make wise decisions? Is there any advice that you would offer? Well, thank you for um, asking me for, for wisdom. It means you think I have some wisdom to offer. So that's very flattering. Thank you. Yeah, so for, for me, I mean, I've, I sat in uh, policy classes with uh, a whole bunch of guys uh, not, not that long ago. And my belief is that p policies do not exist in a vacuum. Uh, so um, to be a policy expert itself is, uh, is almost misleading because pol uh, policy is about something. And so one of the most important things is to, is to appreciate the context of the policies that one is working on. One has to also understand uh, not just the social context, but the political context. What is doable? Uh, a lot of people in the policy space are idealists, and I welcome that. But uh, there's practical idealism, which is to do what can be done and not wait for a perfect solution. There's also humility, which is the, uh, the feeling that uh, the, the understanding that People have different ways of looking at things. Idealists have have a self-righteousness about them that says, oh no, we've got to keep children from working the mines. I'm like, how on earth did you come to the conclusion that children working in a, not working in mines is best for them? Do you have other work for them to do? Do you have a school for them to go to? Oh, so you're saying that if uh, if, if a man has nine kids in, in, the middle, in, in the middle of Niger Republic and they all die of poverty and they have no food to eat, then child number two and three who are like 14 and 15 shouldn't go try help the family. So it looks like it looks like nonsense when you look at it from other people's perspectives. 
you know, so uh, a positive person should try to keep that humility and try not to uh, not to let that idealism and self righteousness uh, rob one of the credibility of uh, of the work. Another thing which is key is that uh, sometimes policy folks do not understand how business works, right? And last time I checked in the history of the world, it's business people that actually run the world, or people trying to make money, or people who already have money, right? So if one does not understand how businesses work and how business decisions are made and what are the criteria that lead to business decisions being made, then one is uh, doing himself a real, a real, real disservice. Right, because if I if, if I'm trying to permit a mine, and someone has written a policy where we need to do like 13 EIAs, which is going to take 20 years, right? And the people in the community want that mine because they need jobs. Then you know there's different ways of looking at it. Uh, and uh, so if a policy guy does not understand the implication of that delay, if you cannot do a cost-benefit analysis to understand where the other person is coming from, you might actually be getting in the way of development of a, actually be extending the poverty of people who are desperately poor. Right. So if I was a strictly policy person, I'll make sure that I understand business. Not the whole of it. You don't have to focus on how HR works, right? But things like uh, even if the interest rate changes, how does that change the investment case, right? Things like, you know, if I can accelerate my revenue and bring it up one year, how does that change the valuation of my business, right? I think that is totally key. Nobody has any business doing policy unless you understand that's in, in energy and oil and gas unless you understand how businesses work what the investment cycle is unless you understand how changes to the economy you know presents a risk to a business person presents a risk to a community seeking an investment okay and finally unless you understand the politics of the area right i mean if you grew up in north america uh, you know all you're going to hear is oh yeah you know it's all multi-party democracy the rest of it is is not good no you know every you know in some of the places that are growing fastest in the world, they're not democracies in the, in the same way. And some of the people who live there are not complaining. You know, they're like, okay, well, you know, we have other priorities. You know, uh, so one has to be ready to, you know, to check one's bias. Uh, most of which in the world has to do with ideological bias. Now gets in the way of good policies. Things like class bias. You know, I grew up in the suburbs. I think every child should go to school. Yes, they should, but they have to eat in the morning before they go to school. If there's no food to eat, school is not going to make sense. Right. Oh, well, you know, the government of Uganda, they're spending 30% of the tax take on the army. And that's bad. You know, you ought to spend five. But no, if there's no peace in Uganda, nobody's going to go to school. Right. School is peace. You have to have peace. So if you have to spend 90% of your funds to fight off the bad guys and it would come to a deal, an agreement with them, if that's what you have to do, that's what you got to do. Right. And it, at that time. So a, a policy person must have a broad mind, must be well read and, uh, and have broad perspectives, but must you know, be humble and they must understand business and economics and politics. Otherwise, the rest of it is just pointless idealism. That's not going to move the world. That sounded like wisdom to me. Oh, sure, sure I did. Will, I will send you an invoice right away. <laughs> <laughs> Consulting fees. <laughs> Baba, thank you again for taking some time to be here with us today. Uh, thank you for all of your wisdom and your insights. This has been a really eye-opening and engaging conversation. Uh, and I know that we are all very, very grateful for your time and for your thoughts. Thank you. The pleasure is mine. Uh, I do wish you all all the best and hopefully we can all stay in touch. We love that. Let's go to takeaways for our usual hosts and I'll go first. One of the things that I noticed throughout our conversation is that several times we asked Baba questions about how things should be or what people should do, and he transformed those into questions of what people can do. So we were sort of offering these normative questions, how ought things to be, how ought people to behave, and he was transforming them into mostly descriptive questions about how the world is, what what really is going on, what can people do instead of what should people do. Uh, and I noticed that a couple of times, um, the comment about kids and their options being to work in the mine or to continue to have a greater level of food insecurity, for example, or the conversation about governments and seeking funding for infrastructure projects. And that stood out to me because that's something that I uh, spent quite a lot of time thinking about in a past life. And I think one of the things that is kind of underneath that is that this idea, I think, that Baba has where it's like, what people should do is what they can do. People should do what they can do. Uh, and he's very focused on what 
that menu of options is, what a person can do. So I was thinking about like how to make this, how to make this concrete. Like this is all very sort of philosophical. I was thinking about uh, like, like my fridge, you know, what should I eat becomes what can I eat? And then broadening that out, if you think about for any given person, what should they eat at any given time? It's going to be, well, what's what's in the fridge? What can they eat? What options really are available to them? And at least in theory, I mean, there's there's thousands of foods in the world. There's There's a million things that could be in like the set of all fridges at any given time. But for one person, what's in the fridge is going to be, you know, a narrower set of stuff. And it's going to have a lot to do with who that person is and where do they live and what is the grocery store like and what is their financial situation like and where did they grow up and what kinds of foods do they enjoy? Uh, and so, you know, the question of, so if it's, you know, people should do what they can do, what a person can do, what options are realistically available to them specifically in their specific environment, that is going to have, that always has everything to do with larger social, economic, and environmental factors. So that is what I was thinking about through that conversation. Yeah, you bring up a good point when Baba was talking about child labor and and having to choose to work. It hit home for me. I was thinking about when I was 15 years old down in Austin, where I'm from. During the Great Recession, we were struggling with keeping the house and I was forced to drop out of high school because we lost the house. But leading up to that point, my mother had lost her job and she took on three part-time jobs where my sister and I helped her at one of her jobs, cleaning dental offices, where we would get home at four in the morning and then expect to attend school or be at school at seven in the morning. And it's easy to say that child labor is is morally wrong, but Again, back to your fridge example, when that's all that there is in the fridge, you got to do what you got to do. You know, that's that's what you got to take for it. Following the bank for closing on our house, I was standing out in front of um, Home Depot on St. John's looking for um, day labor. And, you know, that's just that's just what I had to do. I had to figure it out. I had to go work um, to help support myself, to help support my mother. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for that, Christian. I think it kind of seems to me like we're all a bit on the same wavelength here as to Baba's point that nothing really ever happens in a vacuum if kids are working because they need to work. It's not necessarily a choice that they're making out of many choices. It's a product of a whole system, a constrained system and a constrained set of choices so i mean going back to your fridge example quinn going back to your fridge example quinn what you should eat is really only just what you can eat it's about what's in the fridge right and to me my underlying takeaway here is we need to change what's in the fridge right what goes in the fridge is what's in the grocery store and what's in the grocery store depends on your neighborhood your community and all of the people in that supply chain that are deciding what to stock in those stores, which stores need which products, right? And on and on up the supply chain, back to the farmers, back to the growers, there are decisions being made here and institutions that are at play. They're not set in stone things that are immutable, right? So taking it back, back to mining and natural resource extraction, we have been talking in this podcast about the whole the whole chain, right? You start with the actual extraction. Who are the people that are going into the communities to say, we want to mine these resources, right? Are the decisions that are made there beneficial to the community? Because if not, it doesn't have to be that way, right? And then going forward, transporting the resources, proce- processing them, what's the waste that's coming from that? Are there better ways of doing it? Because if so... We probably should be doing it like that, right? And then all the way to the consumer. Um, Are we producing sustainable markets and sustainable systems for consumers? At the end of the day, if you're being limited by what you have in the fridge, I think we need to change what's actually being put into the fridge. 
Yeah, that's a great point, Logan. And especially to continue on some of the themes that we've been talking about, bridges and uh, options, and especially thinking about Baba's point about uh, developing nations really deserving like a chance to uh, create larger economies, to uh, bring in foreign investment revenue, uh, create better lives for their inhabitants. Looking from their perspective, it's very hard to be judgmental. Uh, it's very hard for those of us here in the United States and other developed countries to critique and nitpick uh, their financing choices when they don't have a lot of good options uh, available to them. They need a way to grow and develop somehow. With that being said, however, I don't entirely agree with some of Baba's discussions regarding the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, especially we talked a little bit about debt financing and the specter of debt traps that have been touched on by several policymakers and scholars here in the US. Setting aside the primary national security concerns that a lot of American policymakers are referring to when they talk about this, the Belt and Road Initiative is still overwhelmingly dominated by fossil fuels. I mean, according to Boston University's Global China Initiative, as of 2020, 40% of China's overseas power plant capacity funded by the Belt and Road Initiative is in the form of coal-fired power plants. China's pledged to not fund any more coal plants, but uh, these power plants have a life cycle of decades. They're going to be releasing carbon into the atmosphere for years and years and years to come. Uh, the same researchers found that China's overseas fossil fuel investments would amount to about 3.5% of all of the annual carbon dioxide emission emissions from the global power sector outside of China. That seems like a pretty bad deal, especially since we've talked on this podcast before about the disproportionate effects that climate change is going to have on many of these developing countries. It seems to be a case where it may seem like a good deal in the moment. It provides like a an easier way to get funding to provide really what we take for granted like here in the US, like reliable, consistent energy uh, for businesses and for ordinary citizens. But in the long term, it might boomerang back and actually hurt a lot of these countries uh, through rising sea levels, uh, increased extreme weather events. But where this connects to what we've talked about on our takeaways here is there's not really a better option for many of these countries. The, the Biden administration has tried to present a viable alternative in meetings of the G7 with the so-called Build Back Better World initiative. But when I did some research on this, there hasn't really been any news about it in over a year. It's a good like rhetorical phrase, but it doesn't really look like any of the world's largest developed democracies are putting up a significant amount of money uh, for this initiative, and certainly not in comparison with the trillions and trillions of dollars that are being poured into the BRI. So at present, without a substantial and uh, fairly conditioned means of funding from developed nations who are uh, both interested in the welfare of developing nations, but also mitigating the effects of climate change, we don't really have a clear solution and we don't really have a clear plan. As we wrap, I'm going to pull on the gentle thread of hope embedded in some of those takeaways, which are that, you know, things don't have to be the way that they are. Uh, this is one of the the great promising, this is one of the great promises of policy is that systems are powerful, but systems are mutable. If you are on campus at the University of Chicago, uh, please keep your eyes peeled. Baba will be joining us at the Harris School for a Resources and Development in Africa Summit in autumn of next year. We would love for you to come, uh, and that would be a great opportunity if you had a takeaway that you wanted to ask him about. For today, thank you for joining us on From the Ground Up. If you have thoughts or questions, or if you would like to talk to us on air, drop us a line at uc3pfromthegroundup at gmail.com. Mm -hmm.